Hey, so welcome back to a new episode of the Hustle for Good podcast. I'm so excited to have my friend, uh, Kenneth Montgomery. How are you doing, Kenny? Thank you for having me, Steve. Yeah. Pleasure, I'm, pleasure seeing you, brother. Yeah, it's I'm, so good I'm to see you, man. you walking on DeKalb with your beautiful family. Now Thank you, here. man. Yeah, it's, well, we could get more into it, but tell, tell everybody about, like, who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, wow. Um, I only answer that question for you. I usually hate those <laughs> questions. I'm trying to still figure it out, but yeah, um, so. I am actually an attorney. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a, I have my own law firm. I specialize in litigation, mainly uh, federal criminal defense from capital defense, uh, meaning, you know, a lot of people don't think the death penalty exists in, in, in most of the land. They're actually wrong. Federally, there is a death penalty statute where you can be put to death in every state federally. Wow. So I represent uh, people charged with the death penalty statute. I represent people charged with uh, murder, racketeering, conspiracy, um, terrorism, um, white collar crimes. Um, I do state work. I don't do as much state defense as I do federal now, but I do state, most of my state stuff is um, high stakes drug cases and, and murder cases as well. Um, I, I do civil rights. Um, unfortunately, people who have been assaulted or even killed by police, um, I, I do some level some small level of, of personal injury and um uh, uh you know wrongful death um and i teach at fordham law in brooklyn college and um i think that's it legally. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean and and there's much more and we'll, we'll talk about it but to talk about um i what i'm what i'm curious because if you don't know a criminal defense attorney you know, I'm speaking to the, to the audience right now. If you don't like, it's a very, like a very interesting mindset. And one that in which, uh, you know, from just from knowing you and observing that, like, it takes a tremendous, like you are, you are going against odds, right? Yeah. Like you are going against something that is like, you're like, you're starting at, at the bottom mm -hmm. level and you have to work your way up. And, I, could you tell me, like, growing up, what made you go into that line of field, or what in your what in that in your aha that said, like, okay, this is the field, the path that I want to go down? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think I've always wanted to be an attorney um, because of I'm 47, so I was born in 72. At the time that I was born, looking around, I felt the oppression um of people who came from my community like you can see it in the buildings you can see it in our education you can see it in how we lived um you can see how our parents were struggling to make sense of it and for some reason um i had read um malcolm x autobiography at a fairly young age i was third grade i, I had read it um and it was this one part where he wanted to be an attorney and they told him he should be a carpenter. Mm. And um, that just stuck with me. I remember being viscerally angry um, that, they, that he had to make that choice. Um, and that, and it, it intrigued me because I was like, why would someone so important want to be a lawyer? Yeah. And then um, I had somehow convinced myself at a young age that being an attorney is, is putting me in a position of information. Yeah. Um, how it got to criminal, I think, is because I had the belief and feeling that the government wasn't really uh, our friend. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what better way to make the government stand up for what it claimed it believed in uh, than be a criminal defense attorney? Yeah, yeah. And that's... That that's what that was my motivation of, of of why I decided to become a criminal defense attorney. That's uh that's amazing. And you said at third grade you read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah. <laughs> a little, you know, it was a little, little, just a little humble. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> a little, ca little ca casual book reading. Kids are reading. No, in the be, in the be fair, yeah. <laughs> I had I had a really um I had a great I have a great aunt um Edith Pittman who um. She introduced me to Malcolm, um, Miles Davis, um, 
you know, jazz, uh, you know, the, the, the 60s, the black movement. Um, and, and, that, and she was sort of the, the catalyst for that, you know. So I, I remember uh, specifically years ago. So I know Kenny because we both had an office uh, in Dumbo uh, before Dumbo was Dumbo in Brooklyn. Yep. And, uh, and so it was, uh, it was great because it was like this old warehouse and there was a bunch of creative people. and Some of the uh, best times I've ever had. Honestly, it was one of the best times. And it was honestly, too, as, you know, as a black entrepreneur, it was great to be around other black yeah, entrepreneurs. Yes, it was. Like creative and like mm-hmm. your business partner, Phil, is like one of the most creative people that I ever met. Like, like he should be on here, too. Like yeah. he's and and. um but it was a great time to just, I feel like, be alive, right? And, mm-hmm. and um, how, at what step did you realize that you had the capacity to give back? And, and tell us how you started to sort of give back. Like, because the, the one thing, though, that I, like, must respect about you guys and your, your team and your collect, because it's not just Kenny. There's, like, a crew of crew people of mm-hmm. that, that are all high-performing entrepreneurs, intellect and, and, um, and creatives that are like, they're out for not just themselves and to make money, but to really change the community. Like at what point then you start to like organize around that idea? Well, well, you know, I, I think I, I think I've always organized around that from a young age. I think from reading uh, Malcolm and reading, um, other, you know, other people in our community and then looking at what was going on, something just didn't make sense to me. And it was that we weren't, controlling our ecosystem it seems mm-hmm. like our ecosystem was only being con- always being controlled from outside and yeah. even the people from within um their their commitment wasn't really um disciplined so yeah. it was always in my mindset so then you know as you mature and you evolve when i got to new york from college and i was in law school um and i had decided to leave the district attorney's office and start my own practice and then phil had decided to leave Sportswear International and then we were going to start our, our design company together. Um, we both realized like, look, this is powerful because most of, you know, many of the people that we had grew up with, they didn't get an opportunity to um, be entrepreneurs. Um, many of them had died. Many were incarcerated. Many were struggling. Um, and we went to college with people who didn't necessarily come from a Brownsville or Bed-Stuy either. Like they, they came from some privileged communities as well, you know, in college. So when we had decided to go out on our own, a big part of what we were doing was to reach out to the community um, because the young people who were in the community, often they're taught that, look, for you to be successful, you got to leave here and never come back. Yeah. The community doesn't pulsate that way. If, if that's the, 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 the mantra yeah, and it's yeah. these cliches that just don't make sense. So immediately we had decided like, look, somehow we got to reach out to young people. That, yeah. that was the start of it for me. Um, being in, being a lawyer at the time, it put me in the front row seat to many of the ills that our society has culturally and, and practically. So I had already convinced myself the way to change this thing around is to community uh, build with people and not go into communities and preaching to people and say, look, guys, I made it. No, going in and seeing what are the still common core issues that are preventing people from um, succeeding. Yeah. So it, it always was a beginning of it. And I think I had identified education was a way to do it. Because that's where you get um, young people. Um, and and it, it's not just regular formal education, but supplemental education. Okay, you go to school X amount of hours, um, but then afterward, what could we provide that will enhance that experience and also perhaps build some critical thinking to do something else? So you know. Yeah, and so, and so I, there, there's a couple of different directions that I, I would love to go, but tell us about how that manifested in the Combine. Um, so what happened was, you got, you know, you know, Phil, Phil is a designer, you, you know, I had the legal degree and I had some experiences in, in the creative world from family and friends who had been involved, 
Um, then we had other members who were into music and the film. We had um, a couple of other lawyers, so we decided. And then people were coming from different places. Me and Phil were coming from Brooklyn. Mally, uh, our partner and brother, was coming from Newark. Um, then we had uh, people like HB, who was from Chicago. And then uh, uh, Ryan, who was from Detroit. And then Asin from Newark. Like, so we were pulling in people from all these different places with these different skills who we had this commonality and this bond with. Yeah. And we all, as we sat down, we realized that wherever we came from, we had the same issues growing up. So we combined our, our skill sets and our expertise and our perspective. And we were going to put that together and, and mesh it and then use that as a tool to reach out to people and offer uh, services and perspective, you know, and that, that's, that was the concept anyway. That's cool. And, and tell us about like what, so your the combine is, is like a physical space, right? It's a physical space. Um, it's, it's a physical space, you know, uh, I guess wherever we're all at, we're physically there, but it's more of an ideology. Mm. Um, and the ideology is to, is to, um, is to build community through art, um, through education. Uh, we've played a, a significant role in a lot of the political things in New York that a lot of people don't know about, that we don't talk a lot about, but we've supported several uh, important campaigns and, and been in the think tank for a lot of these campaigns that people didn't know about, like Ken Thompson, and um, uh, you know, Eric Gonzalez and, and some other um, political things behind the scenes. Um, but it is a physical place, space, but it's more so an ideology. Um, and I think that is, you know, things that, the thing about ideology is it's, it shouldn't be stagnant, at least in my opinion. It should always be, have room to change and grow. And it's a growing ideology and, and that ideology is founded on self-determination and, um, respect and, and just really trying to change the narrative. Um, yeah. 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 You've talked about the changing the narrative the whole time. And, and I'm pretty sure that that comes out in uh, and talk about the, the mentoring program too, that, yeah. that came out of it. So the mentoring program, we had decided to go to Brownsville. Um, it was a neighborhood where my other partner, me and Keith White, he's the other attorney in it grew up. Um, for those of who don't know about uh, Brownsville, Brownsville has the highest concentration of uh, housing, public housing in the country, um, in, a, in a small space and area. So we both grew up there and went to school there. And we thought that was a perfect opportunity because Brownsville still suffered from underfunding, um, oppression, being marginalized, socially, politically, economically alienated. Um, and we decided to go there and build a relationship with the educators. And the first educator we did that with, with was Nadia Lopez, a principal of Mount Hall Bridges Academy, who's authored a book, um, Brownsville Brilliance, as well as some other books. And um, she opened her doors to us and allowed us to bring in our mentoring um, program, an academic program, which was based on coding and STEM, which brought in half of the combine members. So we taught them how to code. We taught them how to design. We taught them creative direction, photography. Um, uh, and then the other side, we taught them also life skills and then mock trials. And um, I t we would take them to trips uh, in the courthouse and all these other different spaces. And, and we developed these ideas with the educators on our team to um, help enhance critical thinking so that um, you know, these young people can understand that they can actually control their narrative. They don't need to pigeonhole themselves. And, and that was really the source of it. And then, you know, one school led to this school, led to another school in Brownsville, led to a school in Red Hook, led to a school in Harlem, led to uh, How NYC. many schools are you in now? Um, right now, well, no, we're in no schools now. No schools right <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But FYI, we were, we're in we're in Corona. Uh, at, at, at optimal, maybe four or five, um, and then now we we've, we've been reached. We uh, New York City CUNY reached out to us to help uh, prepare their teachers going into the classrooms. So we we're doing that. So now you know we're really trying to look at the next level or how to uh, bridge it. We also have our Brooklyn to Alaska program where we send kids to Alaska 
from uh, from Brooklyn um, every summer. Um, so we have a bunch of different things that, that we're dealing with and we're trying to leverage to, to in, enhance the community. Bro, that's so sick. <laughs> that's so <laughs> sick. <laughs> you know, it's tough. Dude, that's, it's that's amazing. So, and, and so how many kids have you helped? Oh, man. Um, I would say no less than f- it's that's hard to say. It, you know, it, it's it's well, through the we're years, impacting over the years. We 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 are hundreds of kids over the years. Of kids, yeah. yeah. At a that's given amazing. moment, uh, our program uh, in Brownsville was probably twenty kids on a, mm-hmm. on on at any given moment. It was about twenty five in Red Hook. Um, we sent about uh, fifteen young men and maybe ten young women to Alaska. Um, that's separate and apart. Um, and then we, we work closely with Cavi, which is started by Cavi Brooklyn. Yeah. 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 Was yeah, it Rob, Cavi Rob, Dr. Rob Gore. Yes. Rob Gore, uh, emergency yeah, yeah. Room Dr. Kings County hospital. They have maybe, uh, f- another 50 to 60 kids. And then we just recently got into a partnership with the beam center in Red Hook, which is a, it's sort of like, it's a, like media, a media center, right? Like a, yeah, it's, it's sort of like an engineering program. They, yeah, yeah, they yeah, build yeah. things. Sure. And we are we entering into a program with them where we're going to send 48 kids to uh, summer camp in New Hampshire to build out um, spaces in New Hampshire. So we're looking forward to that. That's going to happen in August. So, yeah. You know. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I think in in these days and age, like you know, especially with with the coronavirus, it's really changing how everybody's working and living. Yeah, and, it is, and it's a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot of uncertainty. And, um, yeah. And so I, I mean, don't, I don't know. I, I honestly, I'm I'm very I'm super proud, and and it kind of goes to show you that, like, I mean, I you know, I run mentoring programs that, like, yeah, but. There, people know the value of mentoring, right? Uh, and it doesn't take a lot, right? Like, no, it just, doesn't. It's it, just time. It's, it's just, just time. It's, it's just, time. just like you and a, you and a, a bunch of friends, like decided. And I mean, you and you know that you're all professional. You're going to do it legit, right? Yep. And so it was. Um, and it's humbling too. It's yeah. very humbling because you know what? It's time, but you know, if you want to be at your best, what you realize is that people are entrusting you with their children. Yes. So, you know, that um, that raises the ante and is very humbling. So you got to have a reflection process to make sure that you're always giving the young people agency over themselves. Absolutely. And and, um, and and you're reflecting to see how you can do it better, because some days it's tough because, you don't. you know, I'm not one of those people where, you know, I deal with, you know, I deal with death penalty work where yeah. I see the flip side of what happens when there's no structure high levels of dysfunction and trauma oh and my complex God. trauma. Yeah. And you see it on, a, on, a, on a micro level right, yes. and a macro level. Macro. Right? So it, it helps, you yeah. know, it, it frustrates me sometimes, but it does help um, when you see it in that level. And I think the, the, you got to have a, a reflection process and you got to have an accountability process mm-hmm. in which we hold each other accountable so that the, we're putting these young people in the best position to succeed. Dude, that's so it, that's so inspiring, and I'm and and I love seeing the picture updates about you know what you guys are doing because it just goes to show you like you don't need to have like a big nonprofit organization no, no. with Mm-mm. lots of salaries and an office. No. Like, I mean, it's no. it's a different thing, right? Like, you are like on a on a singular level like you have 50 kids in a program you work with 100 those are 100 lives 50 lives that you've impacted which could then through your mentorship impact thousands of people and so you know i and i love i mean the the whole point behind hustle for good is like listen use what you have to get what you want and then to give back to others right and so absolutely and, and, and it's, you know, it's like one of those things that like, I don't know if you know this, but like I used to mentor in Dumbo every Thursday down the street at the, at the foster care agency. Right. Yeah. I remember. I remember. Yeah, you remember. Right. And man, yeah. that was the best Thursday from, you know, three to four ever. 
Because no, I, it's, it's, it's to me one of the most, it's the most important work that I can do because for me, from a, on a personal level, yeah, if I can make this work and, and, and really grow this, it'll lessen what I have to do in the criminal justice world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. here, here's, here's the, the, where I want to go down with this. So part of being able to project your voice make an impact, or I would say part of making an impact, serving others comes from like having a unique voice and perspective. Mm -hmm. And in many times there are people that are afraid to just say what's on their mind, even though that it's wrong. Yeah. And, uh, and oftentimes, you know, by not projecting who you are truly and presenting yourself, you miss out on opportunities, people suffer, communities don't mm-hmm. think, right? Like, can we talk about that? Because you Absolutely. are the hyper example of saying what you yeah. want, whenever you want, however way you want. Yeah. And in many ways, it's like for people that like look at that, they're like, whoa, how does someone like that have the courage to say that? Is because you're well, speaking because you speak the truth. It's you, I well, mean, it's your truth, but and it's a truth that truth, I resonate with. Is right. I'm gonna tell you. Um, for me, I learned a long time ago that silence is a tool of oppression, mm. and um, I think this society that we live in. I'll, I'll get very personal for a moment. Um, for instance, black males. Um, I, I learned really, really early that. On a, on, a, on, a, on a society level, many people don't really, aren't comfortable with what we have to say. Um, yeah. And when you see what society is comfortable with coming from certain black males, you see that a lot of it doesn't really have a, 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 a original thought. It's more of, oh, they, they believe what these guys are saying, or they're falling in this box. And I read a lot of France Fanon. I read a lot of um, I read a lot of stuff. And for me personally, uh, I, I'm an advocate of black radical thought. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's very necessary in this society. I think if you take black radical thought and intellectual thought out of this society, um, it's one of the few thoughts that hold this society up to uh, up to task. Yeah. So for me, my voice. And, and going through the legal system and seeing how people are still marginalized, how women are marginalized, how other people of color are marginalized. Um, there's no room for people to, to hold their truth. Yeah. If you hold your truth and you are out here and you're experiencing things and you're educating yourself and you're learning from others and you um, are observing and you see that this world is really in certain regards, we put people on the moon and we can do all this exciting things scientifically, but then on other basic human levels, uh, we haven't grown a lot. I, I can't afford to keep my mouth shut with the things that I'm aware of and that I know. Yeah, yeah. I can't because, you know, if, if I do that, if I'm in this position to have all this information and yeah. I keep my mouth shut and I hoard that information, how does that help the next generation of people make this a better society. Absolutely. You no, know, so you know, I, I'm I'm about I think truth to power um is very important. And um I think not just only having a voice, but being able to resonate that voice in spaces where people don't have a voice and then build with people to create practical solutions for these really complex problems is very important. But it begins with not being afraid and having mm-hmm. the courage. Yeah. And, you know, so yeah. I got kids. Yeah. What's that? I have kids. Yeah. And if I'm living my life, um, not a lie, but I'm not being truthful to myself, how can I um, parent my children to, to be courageous in a world that's going to need them to be courageous? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, and, and I feel like, you know, especially too, like if you see the truth and you speak the truth, it allows other people to give permission to speak their truth too. That's what mm-hmm. I found. You know? mm-hmm. I yeah. agree. And, and it's freedom. It's a sense of freedom um, for me anyway, um, that 
you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very respectful of others, but there's certain things that I think we have to call out and we have to be, you know, a lot of truths are very uncomfortable. And it's never to, to get attention or it's never to offend anyone, but you know, it's, the truth is uncomfortable. And it's okay to be uncomfortable sometimes, you know, because what's dangerous is when we're all comfortable and complacent and, and think about how many bad things happen in, in comfort and complacency. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, last question, what could we look forward to seeing from you and your team? And, and like, what, what are you excited well, about? Or for the, for the team, we're really excited about this program that in New Hampshire, because it will be going on a month after, you know, hopefully everything is going to go uh, as planned and we're going to send these kids to Alaska this time around. And if people are interested, you can go to Brooklyn to Alaska.org to see the program. But then this new program with BEAM is very important because it's going to be 48 kids in New Hampshire for the summer um, to give them a new perspective and, 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 a, and a project that we're working on. We're going to, uh, we're going to be working on the, um, the, the King Leopold and what was done in Africa by him. And we're going to introduce that to the kids this summer. And um, we have an art project associated with, with that as well. Um, so we're looking forward to that. We just got to figure out how this pandemic obviously is going to work out. Um, we have our programs coming in Red Hook and Brownsville. Once school gets figured out again, we are working with Erica Mateo in Brownsville at the Brownsville Community Justice Center, um, to reach out to more housing areas in the Brownsville area and throughout New York City, all of the New York City housing public areas. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we're interested in perhaps we have a couple of books that we've done illustration books that we're going to put out, um, concerning certain issues that we think affect the community from gentrification to STEM. Um, and me from a personal level, I got a couple of death penalty cases coming up and some other stuff I got to work on. Um, and they're going to figure it out, you know, just trying to figure it out. Oh man, what happened to your sound? Yeah, no, I'm here. I, I had you on mute because uh, I wanted you to talk. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted, uh, I remember the day where, um, uh, I think I told you this, but I, I remember the day where I sat in your car and you took a call from one of your clients. Uh, I, I can't so, imagine how wild I was. Uh, I'm sure it was. Yeah, so, you're, so your son was still in a car seat, your oldest. Was oh, wow. A- I remember that day. We were in the car yeah. and we were driving through Dumbo and I think you were dropping me off at home or something. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, I remember, I don't remember the, the year, but it was, uh, but I remember the way you spoke with clarity and the sort of the cut through the cut through the nonsense, like, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a very lawyer, but I think, I mean, mm-hmm. which is a Kenny thing, just like mm-hmm. speak the truth, but you, but the, you said it and and then it, it made me think like, I, and I, I, I feel like I told you, I was like, oh man, I was like, imagine if there was like a, a reality TV show. It's like, <laughs> my, my dad is a criminal defense attorney. <laughs> you know, what, what is your son, what is your son like? The oldest? Oh man. Um, Cause he grew, he grew up with you when you were grinding, when you were just like, just that's like. That's a good question, Steve. Um, I honestly, ever since that moment, I kept thinking to myself, what is Stone going to be like? Who is he to grow up with a father like you? He's very, he's always been very coy and observant. Yeah. Um, He is much, he is very focused. Yeah. Very focused. He's not a follower. Mm -hmm. Um. And he he keeps it all close and inside. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm really waiting to see, you know, I'm looking forward to him going to college. He just took the SATs not too long ago. He's going to be graduating next year. Wow. Um, I think that he learned a lot from being around me and Phil. I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my wow. God. Oh, that um, kid's the luckiest kid. I mean, he, yeah, no, I, I feel like all of our kids are lucky, but to grow up with like a Feel like next to you, you know what I mean? He has a, like a lot of confidence. Um, yeah. 
And uh, I, I do think, you know, it's something to be said for a young man who grows up around positive people in the community. Yeah. Yeah, and it provides them a sense of comfort because too often our kids aren't comfortable in their environment. Yeah, and, um, he has that. So, but he, of all, he's very interesting. That's all I could say. Sure, 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 sure. Cool, um, cool. And so, how can people get in touch? What are your oh, websites? If you go to, um, if you go to, obviously, you know, you go to uh, BrooklynCombine dot com. B K L Y N C O M B I N E dot com. Um, you can go to my legal website, which is kjmontgomerylaw.com. Um, like I said, check out brooklyntoalaska.org. Check out brooklyncombine.com. Uh, um, if you're in Brooklyn, you can stop by the Combine office. We're at 198 Rogers between Union and President, right in Crown High. We're not in Dun- Dumbo anymore. I miss Dumbo. We had some of the best office space when we were We did, there. yeah. I know. I know. No mass. You're arm and a leg now. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> But, um, but yeah. you know, we here, man. We here, really, yeah. I'm really happy to see you, Steve. Man. I'm so happy to see. You. I'm so glad that we got to have this conversation, man. And much love and peace. Any and more love kids on the way? I know you got two. two no, I got three. I got three. I'm on. I'm on your level. Yeah, yeah. I have. I have a little girl. I have a little girl. Yeah, two boys and a little girl. Yeah. And your boys are how old now? Uh, five. No, eight, five, and my little girl is two. So oh, wow, man. Yeah, man. You know, it's so awesome. I think I told you that we saw you right before my first was born. Like mm-hmm. my wife was in labor, and we saw you on the street on in in Brooklyn. Uh-huh. Hey, we gotta go to home. <laughs> <laughs> Are you coming back to New York, or is the Midwest where it's at? It's Midwest is is where it's at. Yeah, yeah, for All sure. Right. But That's good, dude. Well, thank you so much for the time. I'll let you know when this comes out. And I'll, let me know so I can send it out. All right, man. Peace and love to the family. All right. Peace talk on. to you later. Bye.